Well, we're going to, for the second week in a row, jump into some very uh, personal issues. Uh, We introduced this subject last week. We wanted to talk about homosexuality and have a biblical discussion about it. Before we get into it this morning, I, I want to just, first of all, welcome you all. It's, you don't know how good it is to see you come back. That was uh, really happy about that. Um, but I also want to uh, just say welcome to any of you who are visiting today. Uh, of course, our online family, we want to send you a special greeting. Uh, last week, uh, a miraculous thing happened uh, here uh, at Grace Chapel. Uh, we typically have about three to 5,000 people that watch the live stream every Sunday. Last Sunday, beloved, over 16,000 people logged on to watch the live stream. And so we want to say hey to everybody out there. I uh, want to thank you for all the love and support and prayers and just so many people um, giving so many great reports. Um, I'm thrilled to get emails and text messages and Facebook messages from people specifically. I mean, this, this is next level now, um, who say, you know what, I've got a friend, a loved one who struggles with same-sex attraction uh, or a family member practicing homosexuality, and I sat down and watched the message with them, and they said, thank you. That's massive. That's massive. And so if you're here this morning and you're struggling with same-sex attraction or homosexuality, you're watching online, uh, I I again just want to say to you in all love and humility, like no stones in my hand, no hatred in my heart, just truth and love for you. And, And our desire would be that Jesus Christ would do a work of grace in your life like he has in so many of ours. Uh, regardless of what the sin is, whether it's homo or hetero uh, sexuality, sin issues, uh, God is good and he can handle it all. And he can redeem your life as he has mine and so many here. So uh, we we do want to welcome you regardless of how you came in the door today and let you know that Jesus Christ is good and that he's for you and that he's not against you and that he will do a saving work of grace in your heart if you'll let him. So thank you for all that. There's so much to talk about, and and we really are going to wrap up our portion of this um, today. Next week, we're going to talk about some other issues. Um, But I want to let you know that um, all of uh, Dr. Foster's notes are going to be online, um, usually by this afternoon, and you can go online and, and, and get all of this. I don't know that we'll cover it all word for word today. But again, our huge desire would be just to create some hunger in you where you can go and get answers so that you as the church can be an equipped Christian and and you can be in that place where you can love people with the truth and you can speak truth into their brokenness. I again wanna let you know about the books uh, down in the Resource Center, Kay Arthur's great book, um, uh, The Truth About Sex, Dr. Foster's book here on sexual healing, uh, fantastic books. Uh, Restore and Sexual Identity, Hope for Women Who Struggle with Same-Sex Attraction. Uh, Great book, it's down in the Resource Center today. Uh, Pursuing Sexual Wholeness by Andrew Comiskey. Um, A fantastic book as well uh, for men who are struggling with same-sex attraction or homosexuality issues. And then When Homosexuality Hits Home by Joe Dallas, another great resource. We said last week, and I'll repeat it again, every Christian should have all of these books so that we are in a place uh, of being equipped and can speak to people um, with some intelligence and some compassion. And so please, please, please find your way to get these resources and, um, and, and become equipped. All right, uh, my dear friend, Dr. David Foster, could you make him welcome again this morning? David, thank you for being here again. So uh, here we go, we're gonna jump right into this stuff again and uh, trust God to do something beautiful with it. Uh, I, I told everybody in the video announcement this week that we were gonna kind of talk about um, the causes and, and, and how to be um, healed and how to begin that journey. And then how, thirdly, how the church can love people who are struggling with same-sex attraction and homosexuality. Uh, but before we get into some of the actual causes of, of homosexual confusion, 
uh, there's a couple just foundational things that we need to know first. And so I want you to speak to those issues, if you would. Well, one of the most important ones, if, if you were to ask the average person on the street, are people born that gay? Almost every one of them would say yes. Uh, we actually did this. We went to Charlotte and we did it in Nashville. We asked people on the street. That's the belief of most people because of the way the media has been reporting the scientific studies that have been done over the last 20 plus years. In truth, there is no evidence people are born gay. There is zero scientific evidence. There's no genetic proof, there's no biological proof. There is zero scientific proof that people are born gay. And even the researchers admit it. Now the media distorts the studies and makes it sound like they've proven something, but even the researchers when pressed by, and they're all gay researchers, almost all of them are gay researchers, by the way, so they're really trying to prove something, mm -hmm. and they're getting millions of dollars to do it. Uh, but even the gay researchers admitted, uh, once pressed by their peers, that they have not proven a connection. So even if there were some sort of connection, it still doesn't excuse the sinful behavior that God calls us away from, mm -hmm. no matter what, what we're born with a predilection for, so. That's why we have to be born again, exactly. Jesus said. Yeah, because we're all born into sin and brokenness. David, I'm sitting here even remembering right now, nearly 25 years ago, I remember I was in Palm Springs with my wife, Sarah, and um, there was a, a headline on USA Today, and, it, and I don't remember it exactly, but the, but the headline basically said that they had found proof that people were gonna be born gay. That was the headline. Yeah. And then when I actually read the article, it said no such thing. And it was that they were trying to find it. But even in the presentation of it, it, it was not being truthful. Right. And even at that time, I remember that time, it was a big news story in Newsweek magazine. Yeah. And in Newsweek magazine, they, they were honest and quoted like some, the world's top geneticist from Oxford University as saying, it's ridiculous. That's not how genetics work. Yeah. So, um, so some foundational things to talk about. Number one would be the, the clear point that people aren't born that way. And, and, and even, and I would stress that, even if they were, it's why Jesus said in John chapter three, we have to be born again. Mm -hmm. Because as King David said in the book of Psalms, we've all been born into sin with a sinful nature, desiring different sinful things. And we need a work of the spirit to do a work in our life to deliver us so that we can walk according to God's will and God's ways. Yeah. Fair. We need to lose our life in order to gain it. Yeah. Um, so beyond that, I, I know that there's kind of a unique mix of influences and events that, that contribute to homosexual confusion. And uh, speak to that. Give us that list. Well, <clears throat> basically, the two pr primary causes for homosexual confusion are failing to bond with same-sex parent and childhood sexual abuse. Now, I must say that most people who have one or both of those <clears throat> influences do not turn out homosexual. So it's even those things are not determinative, hmm. uh, but they are seen in most homosexuality. For example, uh, over half, uh, as, as many as upwards of 90% of male homosexuals don't have that bonding with same-sex parent figure. Uh, in females, it's more like 25% don't have that bonding with their mothers. In female homosexuality, it's mostly the childhood sexual abuse that impacts them. Upwards of 65 to 85%, depending on the study, of lesbians are sexual abuse victims. So this is a significant factor. But even in the males, over half of all male homosexuals are sexual abuse victims. So you have these two looming uh, potential causes but they don't necessarily create homosexuality in any given person. There are a lot of contributing factors that must converge in a unique personality, in a unique way and timing, and that's what I'm about to describe. For example, if you were sexually abused and you were sexually abused as a five-year-old, that's going to impact you far more greatly than if the same thing happened as a 15-year-old because you're at, so, you're at such a critical developmental stage as a five-year-old. So, so timing is critical. Timing. We're talking about timing right here. Timing, yeah. yeah. So when it happens is a big factor. The family dynamics. Uh, were you able to go to your family and tell them? Or did they not believe you? 
Was it a safe environment to go and share what's going on with you? Uh, family dynamics uh, are a big factor in many cases. The emotional health of the child when the trauma happens. Uh, if they're already fractured emotionally, um, that's going to have a, a more deep impact on them than if they're emotionally strong when it happens. Mm -hmm. Same with spirituality. If they know Jesus, if they know his love and he's their Lord and Savior when it happens, they're going to be able to, to resist uh, some of the outcomes of that abuse uh, <clears throat> better. So emotional health, spiritual health, the personality of the person, the temperament of the person, you will probably notice that most homosexuals have a greater sensitivity level than the norm. I have a, I have a great sensit sensitivity level. So when the things that happened to me happened to me, it impacted me more deeply. I took them in more deeply. I misperceived them more easily. Um, and so somebody, like my other three brothers, didn't develop homosexual confusion. We had the same dad, we had the same inputs, essentially within the family system, but I was more impacted by things that did happen. A state of neediness. If a child is not being affirmed, and they're very needy, they need somebody to tell them they're okay, that they're meant to be born, that they're good as a male or good as a female, if they're very needy of all these kinds of affirmations, the children should be getting from their parents, and then they're abused, or perhaps they're not abused yet, but somebody comes along and says, and starts feeding them those affirmations in order to abuse them. Hmm. Well, they become much more vulnerable to that abuse because of their neediness, because of the lack of affirmation in their life, the dependency they have, the, the na na naiveness that's in their life. Hmm. The events themselves, were you brutally raped? or were you inappropriately touched? The difference is going to have an impact in one person or another, and in another person, because of the sensitivity level, it's gonna have another impact altogether. So all of these factors converge in multi multiplicity of ways that probably a computer could not even figure out and predict what's going to end up with homosexual confusion. Mm. Also outside influences, very, very important. Um, say you didn't have a dad, or say your dad was unkind and, and unemotional or whatever. Or it's, just even absent. Just absent. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, he's, he's gone. He's a trucker. He's gone all the time. Um, you can still get that fathering or that mothering, if it's the mother, from outside influences. A scoutmaster, a youth pastor, you know, a teacher, a coach. Uh, there are ways that, that you, the need for being affirmed as a male or as a female can be made up for even though you might have an abusive father or an absent father. So I want you to know that there are variables here. So, so when we describe the various things that cause, cause it, it doesn't mean it necessarily will in any given person. So we're talking about um, common causes now, um, not just foundational things, but the real, we're gonna unpack it a little deeper, the, the common causes of homosexual confusion. Um, the first one being confused sexual identity brought on by a lack of emotional bonding with same-sex parent. Yeah. So go ahead and unpack that for us. Well, um, as I mentioned last week, there's a, there's a window for boys that is important. Uh, everyone bonds with mom when they're born. There's a chemical oxytocin that creates a natural bonding. Um, but with boys, they have to uh, transfer their bond with mother to father in that two to five year old window. There's a, there's a developmental window that's been proven repeatedly in studies where the boy has to transition to f uh, feeling like he's dad or he wants to be like dad. Um, now, of course, if dad is, is unattractive, if he's beating up mom, if he's absent and he's not feeding in those affirmations, the boy is going to miss out on, on some critical input in the development of his sexual identity, his gender identity. Now, this can be made up for through puberty. So say a, a male figure comes in at the age of nine uh, who is healthy and affirming and does the things that the boy should have gotten earlier. That can make up for that. So it's not like either two to five or you're, or you're out you know, mm -hmm. kind of situation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's all kinds of ways that God can send people in to make up for those deficits, including God the Father 
if the boy develops a strong intimacy with God the Father, the father can supernaturally impart the fathering to the boy that he's missing otherwise. Yeah. And this is how I was healed after I came to the Lord. Even though I was no longer that young, the father directly imparted the missing pieces into my soul mm -hmm. as I got into intimate relationship with him. It's beautiful. We're going to talk more about that in a while, I know, but... It's... And again, the perception is everything. I mean, your father may actually love you, but he just doesn't know how to communicate it to you. But if you don't think he loves you, that's your reality, and mm -hmm. you're going to react according to what you believe. And so it's not necessarily the parent's fault even when these things go wrong. Yeah. Um, that's a really important part, and, and I mentioned it last week. You know, Adam and Eve had the best father in the world, and they found their way to sin. And, and I know that there's, uh, there's parents that potentially could deal with a lot of guilt and shame because, oh my gosh, did I not love right or enough? Or, and um, listen, I, I don't know the answer for your individual thing, but I do know this, guilt and shame isn't the answer. Uh, forgiveness and redemption and healing and, and if it was an issue in your family, then like getting that fixed would be an important thing uh, for your future and obviously, through the work of God's grace, all of that stuff is fixable. Mm -hmm. It's redeemable. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what God specializes in doing, is taking broken people from broken circumstances and creating a new creation out of them and, and giving them a fresh start and a new life. And so that's what God does. We can't ever lose, um, 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 lose uh, huh? track of that. It was a difficult word like track. Uh, that I was trying to get from my vast vocabulary. We can't ever lose track of that, that it is God's desire, and not just His desire, but God has the power to do this very thing through His love and grace, and so we can never forget that. We always have to proclaim that. Um, so, we, you know, we see the, the, um, the, the tragedy that comes so often from not bonding with same-sex parent or, or if that gets abused and, and some of the problems with that. I want to go down the list of some other contributing factors, the first one being the peer factor. Yeah. Like how important is it with your immediate peers? What, what goes on there? Well, if you've got a strong family system, it's not as impactful as if you don't. If you don't have a strong family backup system, uh, the peer factor can be brutal. It can be very formative to have peers calling you queer and fag and gay and naming you. You know, as a child, you don't have your identity formed yet, and it's formed by how you are treated and by what people say to you. That's how your identity is formed as a child. And so if you, go, if you have people rejecting you and naming you in all kinds of negative ways, you're just going to believe it eventually. You're just going to take it on as your identity because they must know something as far as you're concerned that you, you don't see. And so it can be a very critical factor. They ridicule you and reject you. What that causes then, it, as it did in me, is you start examining then, why am I being rejected? What do they have that I don't? And I remember in my, before I became a teenager, just sort of looking at the other guys, seeing why were, why were they so popular? Was it the way they combed their hair? Was it the way they dressed? Was it the way they talked? Was it the way they walked? You know, what was it? And so I examined them in detail. I would even follow a couple guys around the school. It wasn't sexual at all. It was an emotional search. Mm. And homosexuality is not a sexual problem. It is an emotional problem. It becomes sexualized in puberty or through child abuse. But initially, it's an emotional problem. So I would study these guys, and eventually I would realize, you know, I'll never be tall like that guy, and I'll never be the quarterback like that guy, and so forth and so on. So I realized that certain things that I was fixing on as the hope for me being made well weren't ever going to happen to me. And so my search turned into envy. I started envying these guys for having what I could never have. And then over time, that turned into idolatry. I began fixing on them. And idolatry is when you put your hope in someone or something other than God. It's when you try to find your identity in someone or something other than God. And that's what I did. So it was a slow process of developing envy and then idolatry. And then, of course, that opened the gates for a demonic stronghold because 
Idolatry is one of the major sins. Mm. Um, the next contributing factor here, societal pressures. Yeah. I, I mean, it just seems like there's so many different contributing factors from so many different places. You know, you can see why people can get hurt and broken and, and confused and all of this stuff. So society pressures. Yeah, they're, they're watching uh, MTV and they're listening, they're watching YouTube videos and even all the comedy shows practically on TV now saying that you're born that gay, it's okay, uh, live with it, uh, it's, it's a blessing, it's holy. Uh, from the president on down, authority figures, s school teachers, uh, guidance counselors, librarians, just everybody is now feeding this message into you as this like eight-year-old kid. Mm. But they're the authorities, they must know what's right. And so you begin believing that. Mm. And when you believe the lie, then you, then you get into problems. So, so that can be a big factor. The thing that, that seems to keep coming up over and over again, and we'll see it as we even continue on, it's, it's this issue of identity. Yeah. It's letting people name you things mm -hmm. that God never does. Right. And, and the importance of, of saying, you know what, I am who God says I am, not who my brokenness or, um, or my struggles or society says that I am. You, you've really got to be careful what you own as your identity because it defines who you are. It actually changes your brain structures and the way you think. Your brain will actually change structure according to what you believe and how you behave. Well, David, we've um, talked about some, some serious things in the midst of all this and we're, we're gonna maybe pick it up a notch here. Um, could you talk to us about the contributing factor of pornography? Well, pornography can be a big factor. Uh, again, it depends on other factors fitting in like a puzzle. But particularly if you're exposed to homosexual pornography as, as a young boy or girl, and uh, you didn't know people did that to begin with or looked like that to begin with. And so it's a big shock anyway to your system, the whole sex being sexualized. And so there's a great deal of chemical imprinting going on in your brain during such moments that are quite formative. And if it's homosexual pornography that you're being shown, you're wondering, why am I being shown this? Does that person think I'm gay? Uh, and then you look at the pictures, and if there's any arousal whatsoever, then you start saying to yourself, well, I must be gay, or it wouldn't be aroused. And all these lies start filtering in from the evil one, starts planting in all these self-doubts uh, about the meaning of what's happening to you. Even uh, heterosexual pornography can contribute in a very sensitive temperament to homosexual confusion. Because as you're looking at those great looking people doing those amazing things in that heterosexual pornography, you might be saying to yourself, I can never do that, I would never look like that, I would never get a girl like that. And so it can push you deeper into your homosexual confusion, even though you're looking at heterosexual pornography. So pornography can be a, a significant factor. Yeah, I, I wanna um, just pause here for a second um, and, and talk to you parents with young kids, okay? Um, I wanna tell you a story that I, I know to be true of a very, very committed Christian family uh, very conservative in what they allowed their kids to participate in, uh, the TV shows that they watched, like really were serious about protecting the innocence of their child. Um, that child grew up and everything, you know, w was good, looked good on all counts. And then that family found pornography on their home computer. And it came out that um, one of the children in the family owned up to it. And then when the parents said, how did you ever even like, and the child said, as a, as a young teenager, years ago, our neighbor, who was a friend, another young child, because that child's father had showed that child pornography, then that child showed it to, the, to this child who was from the conservative Christian family. 
So what am I saying? I'm saying, parents, you can't be too careful. You can do everything right in your own house and it can be undone in a moment because someone who lives a few houses down is, is so sexually broken as an adult that he is showing pornography to his own child and then that child shows it to maybe your child. You don't ever get that back. That, that is innocence gone. The, those, those are imprints in, in, in the mind. Now, whether they have power over you or not in the future is one thing, but parents, please be careful. Amen, somebody? Amen. Yeah. I don't mean to breed fear in any of this, but unfortunately, we live in perilous times, and these are real issues that we have to deal with. Um, let's go a little bit further, Dr. Foster. What is the, the issue with with homosexual play in, in children? Well, there can be one or two innocent incidences, you know, in the early years that may not have any effect whatsoever on the child and usually don't. Uh, the concern comes when you see it repeating again and again and again. Then you, then you really want to address this uh, carefully uh, because that has an imprinting effect on the child as well particularly if they keep coming back to it again and again and again, and reinforcing the, the, the pleasure um, link with that kind of behavior. Um, particularly if it's being done with an older child or an adult, it is even logarithmically more impactful. If your five-year-old is, is having sexual play with a 10-year-old, that has significant more impact on the child than if it's with another five-year-old for example, and certainly if it's with an adult, uh, this needs to be addressed seriously and with, with some good Christian counseling. So David, I really define what you mean by the word play there, because we're not talking about maybe abuse that took place. It could not be physical at all. What does that look like, homosexual play? Uh, touching each other inappropriately in sexual areas. Yeah. These are, and everything up from there. Yeah. Um, um, you made reference a few minutes ago about um, parents and, and uh, not bonding with parents the right way. Um, now this issue of dysfunctional parenting, where maybe there isn't sexual or physical abuse happening, right. but there, there are parental dysfunctions that are happening. Speak yeah. to that. Yeah, I've met a lot of uh, homosexuals who whose parents wanted the other sex when they were born. The boy was born and they wanted a girl. And they treated him like a girl. And that little boy grew up knowing that he was gonna get love and affirmation only if he acted like a girl. And so he was misled by the desires, the selfish desires of the parents and how they either overtly or sometimes um, unconsciously communicated their dislike for what they got and their desire for the other. Uh, sometimes that can be very overt, whereas where you dress up the boy as a girl or dress up the girl as a boy. Um, but um, the child picks up on those cues. And so it's very important, even if you did want the opposite sex, never to communicate that in any way to your child because it does affect them. They do pick up the signals. Um, also, you might have a situation where maybe the mom's getting abused by men. Maybe all her life she was abused by men. And she doesn't realize it, but she's developed a real fear and hatred of men. And maybe she doesn't mean to, but maybe she communicates that to her son. You know, she affirms him when she doesn't, when he doesn't act masculine, and when he does act feminine. Hmm. And so these kinds of scenarios where parents are broken in some way can impact children in quite unexpected ways. We've um, made mention of the spiritual component to this. And this really is a spiritual issue that we're talking about. I, I know it's, it's emotional brokenness that leads to it, but there's a huge spiritual component involved in this. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I wanna be clear about um, this next phrase that we're gonna use, which is demonic influences. Mm -hmm. We're clearly not saying that 
someone with same-sex attraction or, or uh, practicing homosexuality is somehow demon-possessed. And, you know, I, I would never want to paint that wide brushstroke with that. But understanding the spiritual component to this, speak to this issue of, of demonic influences as being a contributing factor. Well, it really starts with the sins of the fathers being passed down from generation to generation. So if you have sexually broken parents, uh, that, that predilection can get passed down to the children. I don't know how that happens, perhaps in the DNA, but definitely it happens in the spirit where the vulnerabilities of the father gets passed down to the, to the child unless the parents become spiritually uh, born again and break the curse. It says clearly in Ezekiel 18 that that curse can be broken yeah. by any generation that decides not to go along yeah. with that particular behavior. So taking the time to break any family curses that you may have brought in from your prior dysfunctional behaviors so that your children are not affected. But then there's also the factor of just sins that the child chooses to commit. I made vows against my father. I hated him, I judged him. And so I was creating ground for the enemy to come in and bring in more confusion because of my sinful responses to the hurt I felt. Um, so so by, by our own willful choices, we give ground to Satan in our lives. And the more willful our sin is, the more defiant it is, the more knowing we were that it was wrong when we did it, the more ground, everything else being equal, Satan gains in that particular moment. And that's not true just with homosexuality. That's true with all sin. Yep. The more we close our fist and shake our fist at God and his ways and say, you know, I'm going to do this thing and I don't care what you think about it. You know, your heart just gets harder and harder and harder to the things of God. The enemy has a heyday with all that. Yeah. Very, very sobering things. And so when you finally come to Christ and actually lose your life to gain it, uh, that's one of the things you'll need to work through is, is dealing with this, the strongholds that have come in as, as a result of your various choices. Yeah. Um, the second really big contributor here, apart from not bonding right with, with your parents, is the issue of sexual molestation, and we've touched on it a little bit. But that can powerfully affect the sexual identification and orientation of a person. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. Yeah, and a boy who's being sexually abused by a male, he's, he's saying to himself, why is he doing this to me? Am I gay? Is that why he's doing it to me? Does he see something in me I don't see in myself? Or am I destined to be, uh, to be this? Is this what I was born to be? And so all kinds of lying thoughts the enemy begins seeding in the mind during, during abuse situations. Uh, for a boy who's being molested by, his, uh, by a, a female, uh, great insecurities can come out of that, particularly if it's your mother molesting you. Uh, you feel a great deal of betrayal. You feel a great deal of pressure. You feel you, a fear of the opposite sex gets engendered that way. Um, so that can be impactful as well. Now for the women, most often it's, a, it's being abused by a male. Uh, but if they're abused by females, the same thing can happen. But uh, for females who are being molested by men, uh, naturally they're gonna be afraid. And if they, if, if they take that to all men in their thinking, then they're just gonna be afraid of men in general because who knows who's gonna do it next. Mm -hmm. And that could even develop into a hatred of, of men. So, so childhood sexual abuse is, is very impactful, but not necessarily causal for homosexual confusion. A major contributor to it. Major contributor to those who have homosexual confusion. Yeah. Now, friends, this is where I want to uh, talk to you um, because I think this really has the ability to, to shape not just your personal life, but to shape Grace Chapel as we go into the future. When we hear these things about the effects of physical and sexual abuse on, on precious, innocent little kids, that has to cause, it has to cause major compassion in our hearts. It has to. Like if that doesn't, I, I don't know what's ever gonna make you feel any compassion for anybody. When you think about little boys and little girls at very young ages being physically or sexually abused, 
They didn't sign up for it. They didn't volunteer for it. They didn't want it to happen. They didn't ask it to happen. And this tragedy came upon them. Can we just agree like that that's not the fault of a precious little boy or girl? Like that's not their fault. And now these other contributing factors happen and now we've got someone who's 30 years old. And based on all of these contributing things, they find themselves as an adult living a homosexual life. And the church, because we don't understand a lot of this, and we just pick some verse out that says that it's an abomination and they should stop it. The, the church isn't a place of healing for them, it's a place of condemnation. And so what we need to allow God to shape into our hearts is massive amounts of education and understanding coupled with huge compassion. They didn't ask for this to happen. And so I just, that's just, that's the pastor part of my heart that just says, God, could you do that in, in all of our lives here at Grace Chapel? <laughs> and, and could people stay and let you do that in their hearts instead of leaving and being offended that I'm saying that we need to show the grace and kindness of God to every type of broken person in the world. Let's not pick and choose. All right, so we've talked about enough of the things that are, that are heartbreaking and disturbing and sad. Like we need to get to some good news here pretty quick. Amen. And so um, I, I wanna talk for the next little bit here about healing homosexual confusion and kind of getting the ball rolling on, on how does someone start their healing journey. Now I also wanna again parenthetically say that what we're about to talk about for the next several minutes isn't just for sexual brokenness. Right. It's like whatever your struggle is. You're pounding too many Twinkies, this will work for you. <laughs> you, you can't put down the Diet Cokes like this will work for you, okay? The, these are spiritual principles that, that when we avail ourselves to God fully, which is what he asks, then real life change happens. So, healing homosexual confusion. What should a person with homosexual attractions do to get their healing process started? Well, like any other uh, sinful lifestyle, it's confession and repentance is where you must start because that's where you, God comes in and changes you, makes you a new creation and comes in with power to enable you to resist things you had no power to resist prior to that. So confession and repentance is absolutely critical. There's a gay Christian movement out there that's saying, no, you don't have to repent. Uh, you can keep on uh, practicing homosexuality and still be a Christian. That's not what the Bible teaches. Right. The Bible teaches we must come to the cross and lose our lives in order to gain it. And we must give up whatever God calls unholy. And so we need to confess that it is sin and repent of it, say that we're sorry for com committing it, and in some cases even renounce. I mean, God pointed out to me on many occasions over one sin or another, I want you to renounce that thing. I want you to speak against it aggressively yeah. and, and cut it off from your life as ever again being an option in your life. Yeah, this is so important, David. W words like confession and repentance and renouncing, these are, these are words of action. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're aggressive words. They're, yeah. they're things that we have to get serious about. Yeah. Like you can't, you can't just kind of mamby-pamby your way through your Christian experience expecting any transformation in any area of your life, right. especially areas of profound strongholds. And so our, our answer to people who are struggling with anything isn't, we'll give Jesus a shot or give Jesus 20% of your life and roll the dice and see what happens. No, what God has told all of us is, if you'll seek me with all, would y'all say all? <laughs> all? If you'll seek me with all your heart, then you'll find me. 
And so our message is this, if you want to be free from whatever it is that has you bound, it's going to require you getting active and aggressive and going after the one who can heal you. Well, that's going to take too much effort. Well, the results of that effort are much more beneficial than the results of the lack of effort, I assure you. And so I, I want to be clear, we're talking about an all-in commitment to Jesus here that will change your life forever. Yeah. We have to say that. I, I don't want to preach a watered down gospel that just says that, you know, just kind of do it halfway and it'll be all right. I, I'm free today. I, I'm, I'm free from doing drugs and getting loaded and chasing women. I'm free from that. Why? Not because I went to church every once in a while. But because at 18, 19 years old, I made a committed decision to say, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. Mm. And if you're Lord, I'm going to do as much as I can with the power that you give me to obey you and to walk this out. Mm. I'm not going to play games. I'm not going to pretend Christian. Now, it hasn't made me perfect, but it has got me way further down the road from where I started. You can't play. You got to be all in. And you'll find out when you're all in that there's nothing better than that. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps you free. We've been interviewing homo ex-homosexuals for years now. And I like to ask them at the end of the interview, are you, are you happy that you went through the difficult healing process? Would you, do you have any interest in going back? And to a person, they would never go back. They would never, uh, their, their, what is that song? Uh, I wouldn't give nothing for my journey now. Mm. Uh, that, that's the attitude 100% of the people I've worked with have come out of homosexuality. Yes, the healing process can be arduous. There's a lot of brokenness and a lot of pain that needs to be healed. But it is way better than what, what the alternative is. <clears throat> Not to mention eternity with God forever. <laughs> amen, amen. So confession and repentance of sinful behavior, uh, idolatry, rebellion, unforgiveness, self-pity. Yes. All, all four of those things, just radically important parts of this that we have to confess and, and repent of if we're struggling in these areas. Yeah, and often uh, somebody coming out of homosexual thinks, well, it's not fair, you know, I didn't ask for this, and, and it's just not fair. God's going to understand if I go ahead and do this. And uh, look, lots of people have trials in their life. At least you weren't born without arms and legs. You weren't born with a lot of other conditions that are even more difficult. So, so you're not being singled out by God for some hard task. In fact, what God wants to do is to turn your hard task into his glory and, and into great fruit for the kingdom of God. Yeah. Um, and you will thank him for all of eternity for what you went through because it gave you a chance to give him glory in the end. Yeah. We got to pick the pace up big time, David. Uh, so how do you engage the Holy Spirit in the healing process? How, how, do, how do we actively, we're talking about getting aggressive now, how do we go about that? What does that look like? <clears throat> well, you have to practice the presence of God. Mm. I love this line from Ann Ortland. She said, it is the look to Jesus that saves, but it is the gaze upon Jesus that sanctifies. That's it is great. when we enter into this intimacy with him where he becomes our father, the perfect father maybe we never had. And he begins to affirm us, and he begins to impart the missing pieces, and he begins to heal the damaged soul. That's when things really begin to turn around and the joy starts to come. And so, and it's the answer for everything really. It's the purpose Absolutely. of life is to develop an intimate relationship with God the Father, yes. and then just do what he tells you, that's it. That's the whole of life. Yeah. And it is a joyous life. It's, it's, I would never go back yeah. to anything that I once did to lose that. Uh, calling upon the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver us. Again, not just for sexual brokenness, but for all things that any of us struggle with. It's, it's not by might nor by power, but by God's Spirit. It's not us pulling, well, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, I ain't even got any bootstraps. <laughs> 
Like, I need, I need the Holy Spirit to come and, and empower me with that, with that dunamis, that dynamite spiritual power to be a witness for Jesus and to live a transformed life. Christianity is not about, this is what I'm going to do. It's about saying, God, I can't do it. Now you give me the power to do this, and here I go. Yeah. I'm grateful that Jesus said in Luke eleven thirteen, 13, right? The Father will give you the Holy Spirit if you ask him. Right. And ask, again, is an aggressive word. It's to beg and to crave, to desire above all things. When God sees a heart like that, he goes, hey, let me hook you up. And it means to believe it. Yeah. Jesus said he would give the Holy Spirit. You need to believe that when you're asking him. I'll, I'll never forget one night I was uh, committing a relatively minor sin compared to all the rest. And I was... Uh, <laughs> Just go ahead and tell us what that was, David. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was complaining to the Lord, Lord, you set me free from lots bigger stuff than this. How come you're not setting me free from this? And he said, it's because you love it. That was a great revelation because, yeah, of course, it wouldn't attract me if there wasn't some part of my heart that still loved it. And so I knew what my marching orders were from that point on on that sin. It was to ask the Lord to give me a greater love for him than that sin and therefore to empower the deliverance from it. Yeah. Galatians 5.16, in talking about the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul says if we walk by the Holy Spirit, we're not going to carry out the desire of the flesh. That's right. And so it, it's, not a, it's not as much about not doing these bad things as it, as it is just fully giving yourself to the person and work of the Holy Spirit. That's the real issue because when you do that, then you're not going to do this other stuff. Yeah. And not going off on your own self-righteous attempt to fix yourself, but waiting on God to release the power over whatever's tempting you. It says very clearly in is it 2 Peter 1, 3, that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Right. So it's already resident within you. The power over sin by virtue of the presence of Christ within you is already resident. It just needs to be released by your desire for it to be released right. and your faith that God loves you enough and has the power to overcome what you're up against. It is about appropriating your identity that is in Jesus Christ that gives you power over it all. It is about identity and the power of God over and over and over again. First Corinthians 10, 13 says, when you are tempted, God will provide the way out so that you can stand up under it. Mm. You either believe that or you don't. If you believe yeah. it with all your heart, he'll do it. Yeah. David, let's quickly talk about the, the, the issue of renewing our mind because as you said, you know, we get filled with thoughts from outside and society and peer pressure and the devil will lie to us big time. So the importance of renewing our mind in overcoming our struggles, again, regardless of what your struggle is, you got to have your mind renewed. Yeah. The Bible says, clothe yourself with Christ. Yeah. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means getting into the Word on a regular basis and letting it renew your thinking. Getting into God's presence and listening for His voice, telling you what's true as opposed to what you feel or think. Because yeah. feelings lie to you all the time. Let me tell you a story. I was, I was speaking once, and this lady abruptly stood up and marched out of the room. And I was speaking on child <laughs> That happens to me all the time. <laughs> And I was speaking on child abuse, so I thought, oh no, I've just, I've just set her off into memories of her own child abuse, and now she's going out to kill herself. And all of these thoughts started flooding my mind of the big mistake I just, just made, and, uh, even though I kept teaching. And, uh, and then she came, five minutes later, she comes back and sits down. Well, truth was, she had gone to the bathroom. <laughs> but what had happened to me? I believed my thoughts and my feelings, which were lying to me. Right. I just didn't even think to challenge them. I just believed them. And we do this. We believe our thoughts and our feelings without even thinking about it. We need to test them according to the Word of God. Yeah, when we, we did the series last year on winning the mind wars, um, you know, that was received so well and people understood the fact that, you know what, I, I can't choose the thoughts that my mind has, but I can choose what I do with them. 
which is the issue here. I've got to learn 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, where I'm taking those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And so either my own flesh conjures up some sinful thing or the devil downloads some sinful thing into my mind. What am I going to do? I'm, I'm going to put it through the filter of what's God's way, what's God's word, what's God's will. And if it comes out where it's not in line with God's word, way, or will, I'm taking that thing captive and saying, that's not the, the will of God in Christ Jesus for my life. Again, I, being aggressive. Yeah, I renounce it. I renounce Jesus. it in the name of Jesus. I renounce it as the lie that it is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so not just renewing your mind, but guarding your heart. Guarding your heart and mind. Same thing, you, you need to surround yourself with healthy members of the body of Christ so that you, iron sharpening iron, they sing, see things that you need to address that maybe you don't. I know that happens in a marriage. I've not had the opportunity uh, to experience that within a marriage, but, <laughs> but at least within the body of Christ, uh, it can happen as well, especially in small groups. Amen. And I, I, this one surprised me, the powerful effect of serving others. Um, I went for a good 10 years getting healed up. And I was in a great church where healing the broken people was, they were, they were really good at it. And, uh, and then one day the Lord says, you know, David, I don't want you to come for prayer anymore. I want you to pray for others now. Hmm. And I started praying for others. And God started healing me even faster once I took my focus off of myself and started focusing on the needs of others. And that gets missed a lot. Yeah. Um, what does God actually do to heal the brokenness? Like, how, what, how does God do his part of this? Well, as I've already mentioned, he, he replaces what was lost. If you get into that intimate place with him, he will begin to replace what was lost. He will speak into you your goodness as a male or a female or, or whatever you need. He'll begin to um, just transform your thinking. And just, just being with him, the, Sometimes he'll let you feel his presence, the love that he has for you. Sometimes you'll just feel it in the room. That is massively healing. One two-second feeling of the love of God can heal, you know, 10 years of some kind of bondage. Man. That's how powerful that is. Well, David, tell the story briefly, because I, I, I find it so personal and so powerful. Um, when um, something that your father didn't do with you, the Lord did with you in a vision one day. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, this is beautiful, I love this. Yeah, one of my big pet fees as a child was my father never played ball with me and I was a big baseball fan. And uh, he never threw, threw the ball with me. So, 15 years later, I'm in my healing process, just minding my own business, singing love songs to God. And suddenly I get this vision and God the Father is throwing Throwing the ball to me. Who'd have thought? Um, that's something you don't make up on your own. You don't expect that God knows you that well and loves you that deeply. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing he can surprise you with when you get into his presence as a lifestyle. He's that personal. Yeah. Of course, God's a baseball fan too. Exactly. Yeah. And he loves the Yankees. All right. Hey, Genesis chapter one, verse one, in the big inning, I'm just saying. <laughs> all right, all right. Something else beautiful that God does is God transfers his wholeness into you. Mm -hmm. he, he, he doesn't just replace what you lost, but he actually transfers his own wholeness into you. Yeah. He doesn't just patch you up and make a better old you. You actually become a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. Yes, and he returns your innocence to you. I don't want to describe to you how jaded and fallen and sexually broken I was, but I was very perverse when I got saved. I never could believe that I would be innocent again, but God actually over the years returned my innocence to me. Uh, I now blush at jokes that I would not have thought anything about before. And when I discovered that I had that innocence once again, I just rejoiced in my spirit at the at the degree that God will go to transform you into his image if you pursue him for it. David, I wanna uh, skip down for time's sake here. And again, you can get the notes online. Uh, toward the bottom of, of page eight there, what advice would you give a parent 
that could help them minimize the chances for homosexual confusion that might try to develop in their own children. Long list, but if you could just yeah. crank through. Protect your child, but don't exasperate. Don't smother them in protection, but do protect them. Do gender identified things with them. If your son likes to play baseball, throw the ball with him. Uh, or whatever the child is liking to do. Whatever speaks to the child that they're one with you. In that your, affirms their gender. That affirms their gender. Yeah. Uh, do uh, give non-sexual physical love and affection to them. Hug your son. Do not be afraid that you're going to make him into a homosexual. That's ridiculous. Hug your son and affirm him and love him and, and tell him when he's done well. And do the same with your daughters. The, by the way, the father it calls both son and daughter into their sexual identity. It is a unique thing that the father does. So this is important. Take time to reaffirm their masculinity or their femininity. When you see them doing, uh, performing as a male or a female uniquely well, let them know you're proud of them. That you're, you have joy in them over that. I, I think Tim Taylor from Tool Time was very successful at that with the three <laughs> little boys. Uh, any of the fathers know what his thing was, right? When the little boys did something right, or, ar, 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 you know, that, that's a biblical principle right there. I'm just telling you. I think I missed out on that. <laughs> you should go back and watch it. I think it would be very healing. I think it would be great. I don't know what you're talking the about. Power the power of tool time, I'm just saying. <laughs> Next. Tool schmoles. I missed out on that one. I'm not getting that one back. Create an atmosphere in your family where your child is free to ask you anything and teach them sexual knowledge at an age-appropriate level, at the level that they express an interest in it, mm -hmm. and to the depth that they request. Don't give them a huge answer to a short question. Uh, and to the extent of their exposure to it in the culture. Now the culture is sexualizing our children far sooner than is healthy developmentally for them. But if the culture's already doing it, you've got to have an answer for them as well on, that, on whatever that issue is. Teach them the biblical model for sex and the standards for sex. Do it with grace and truth. Yeah. Teach them the realities of sexual temptation and the dangers and the ways to respond to them. Do it at an age-appropriate level as they grow up. Tell them your own war stories if, if it's an age-appropriate level. Carefully check out all children and adults who are given charge over them. Yes. Stephen highlighted that quite nicely already. Teach your children that they should not obey authorities who try to engage them in sexual activities and that they should report those who do to you, no matter what threats are made against them. However, teach them not to tell the perpetrator that they're going to report what he or she has done because that might put them in danger, mm -hmm. but to tell you as soon as they can after it's over, as soon as they can get the chance. Um, the last two I just threw in because it was my experience. Uh, don't let your children go to health spas or hitchhike alone. These are great breeding grounds for homosexual seduction. I, and almost every time I ever went to a health spa and almost every time I ever hitchhiked, I was approached homosexually. Mm -hmm especially in the showers. So once I got saved, I still went to the gym, but I just stopped going into the showers. I just went home and showered at home. So if I had young children, that's how I, I might handle that. Have a friend or you go with them and shower at home. Praise and affirm them as often as is appropriate. Would be my last piece of advice on that. Yeah. So friends, looking over the last two weeks and all of the massive amounts of information, we, we want to get to this third and final point, which is just a couple sentences. How do we, as the Church of Jesus Christ, practically love the homosexual? How do we show them the love of Jesus? It boils down to what we started with. You have to know what the truth is, and you have to speak it in love. Ignorance and silence isn't love. Know the truth. You, you can't look at someone again and just say, well, my preacher said it was bad. If you'll study to show yourself approved and be able to articulate 
um, some of the issues with it, it's going to show that person that you actually care enough to learn about something that really hasn't anything to do with you. So study to show yourself approved. Speak the truth in love. Respect, don't condemn. Remember, be compassionate because a lot of these folks didn't ask for the things to happen to them that did. And then lastly, I would just say, be the Christian that they don't think exists. Be the Christian that they don't think exists. Don't hold back from speaking the truth, but do it with love and compassion. If we'll do that, instead of just shouting at the darkness all the time, we might be able to see the light of Jesus turn on in some people's hearts, and we might from this very platform hear testimonies that would boggle our mind. I'm up for that. Is anybody else? Yeah, me too.